Welcome to ATVB PVD 2017 here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm Kieran Musunur. I'm an associate professor of cardiovascular medicine and genetics at the Paramount School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. It was my privilege this morning to participate along with these two gentlemen in a special plenary session on genome editing, and specifically the scientific, clinical, and ethical considerations around genome editing in the year 2017, as things stand now. As I said, we all had some fun this morning uh, participating in this session. We each gave our little talks and then followed it up with a very interesting polling of the audience to get their opinions on some of the issues surrounding uh, genome editing uh, and the therapeutic implications of genome editing and even the possibility down the road of human germline genome editing. So I'm going to turn it over to each of these gentlemen to uh, describe their interest in genome editing and how it's impacting the work that they're doing in their laboratories. My name is Joe Miano. I'm a professor at the AB Cardiovascular Research Institute at the University of Rochester in New York. And uh, our lab uses CRISPR-Cas9 for the development of mouse models to help better, better understand uh, cardiovascular diseases and other diseases as well. Uh, we specifically uh, edit the germline of mice and then use these mice to ask fundamental questions about the control of genes, what turns genes on or what turns genes off, where and when, and also the functionality of proteins that otherwise would be intractable to study. My name is William Lagore and I'm an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And my lab works a lot with adeno-associated viral vectors, or AAV. And we're using this technology to try and deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery uh, to mice, uh, particularly to the liver and other tissues, um, to better understand uh, the basic biology of lipid metabolism, to manip manipulate gene expression, and figure out um, the contribution of new genes to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular risk. We're also trying to adapt the CRISPR-Cas9 system to uh, preclinical genome editing of certain rare lipid disorders and hope that this will uh, actually provide some long-term correction for people that don't have a lot of treatment options. So my personal interest in CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing is actually quite broad. So my laboratory uses it in almost everything we do nowadays. That just gives you uh, some sense of how transformative this technology has been. It really only emerged in early 2013 and already it dominates uh, what every single person in my lab is doing now. Certainly we're using it to answer a lot of scientific questions. My personal interest is in risk factors for cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease, so blood lipid traits, diabetes, and so forth. So as Joe explained, using CRISPR-Cas9 to modify the germline of mice, making so-called knock-in mice, not out mice, uh, to really get the sense of how different genes contribute to cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. But like Bill, I'm also keenly interested in potential therapeutic applications of CRISPR-Cas9. So this morning I spoke to uh, one such effort, which is to target the gene PCSK9, which I think uh, many of you listeners will be very familiar with. It's become a hot therapeutic target. There are two antibody-based drugs that are on the market now. And just last month there was outcomes trial data showing that one of these medications does in fact reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke, um, which is a very positive thing. It's uh, very exciting new therapeutic class of medications. And so we're targeting this gene, but in a different way, and that is to make permanent alterations of the gene within the genome in the liver with the hope of essentially turning off this gene. So instead of having to take a pill a day for the rest of your life or having to receive injections of antibodies to clean PCSK9 out of the blood, taking those injections every few weeks for the rest of your life, our objective is to see whether we can devise a one-shot therapy using genome editing, target the PCSK9 gene or other uh, such genes in a permanent fashion so that you only need to receive the therapy once and then we'll have lifelong protection. So not unlike a vaccination, if you will, against cardiovascular disease. So I spoke to some of those issues this morning with respect to the progress we've made on those projects. The other issue that uh, I raised near the end of my discussion in order to launch to a broader discussion of the ethics and social considerations around genome editing is the whole idea of human germline genome editing, which has gotten a lot of press, a lot of covers of magazines, a lot of headlines in newspapers. The idea being that, well, we know from the work of Joe 
and others that CRISPR-Cas9 works very effectively in mouse embryos, which is very useful as a research tool because it allows us to make mouse models of disease very readily. But it turns out the same technology, CRISPR-Cas9, works pretty efficiently in human embryos in those few studies that have been published to date. And so this has opened the door, as many of you will appreciate, to the possibility that one day, not too far in the future, CRISPR-Cas9 could be used to either repair disease-causing mutations or introduce protective or beneficial mutations within human embryos and then actually have children who are born who carry those, those DNA variants, those protective mutations, or who are free of disease-causing mutations that their parents might have. And this is obviously a very touchy issue. It raises all sorts of issues that go beyond the bounds of what we normally think about in scientific discourse, issues of ethics, issues of morality, issues of practicality in terms of access to therapy in an equitable way among the entire population, and so forth. It also has really long-term implications, because if this does come to pass and the ability to modify the human genome is done on a widespread basis, we're really talking about implications for the long-term health and well-being of the human species. So it's not a trivial topic. But we had a very interesting opportunity, and I think uh, my two colleagues here can also speak to this, simply asking questions, opinions of the audience about what they think about some of these issues. And so, you know, I, I was actually quite surprised with some of the answers uh, that we got. I don't know if either of you want to comment on it. Yeah, I thought it was a very informative discussion of the issues, and that it was great to see the polling of the audience to see exactly where they stand on these on these issues. I was really struck by the uh, kind of overwhelming support for uh, somatic genome editing for therapeutic purposes, and I was also kind of surprised to see um, just how much support within our audience was was present for uh, even editing of the human germline in the right situations. Um, where it could be done just depending on exactly what the methods that would be used to achieve that um, might be a consideration, but there seemed to be a considerable amount of support for that. And as Kieran mentioned, I think there's a lot of uh, very important issues that this brings up. Uh, one is a very fundamental philosophical issue as to you know whether we're actually going to change uh, what it means to be a human being and, and alter our own DNA from the very beginning. And while the, the tools are pretty basic right now, um, you know, this won't be the case in the future, and so I think this has you know, really profound implications for society. I think it's something that the public needs to be involved in, uh, in, in this discourse. And as scientists, I think we have to um, really make it our goal to clearly communicate the, the issues and concerns and implications of this research uh, to the public and involve them in the conversation and also be respectful of, of their views on this, this very exciting technology. Yeah, so I quite agree. I thought this was uh, perhaps the most entertaining part of this morning's uh, session, having the audience uh, actively participate in answering some of the questions, these, these penetrating questions that we're confronted with. And it's important that we have these discussions. The, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine really call for, as a mandate, uh, public discourse uh, surrounding the use of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing in the context of somatic uh, therapies, as well as the more thorny issue of germline genome editing. And so having uh, scientists sort of lead the, the way in this discussion will be pivotal uh, in, in educating the public and, and having them weigh in on these weighty issues uh, of, of fundamentally changing who we are and who the next generation of people will be. Um, are we in a position to make decisions for people who don't even exist yet? These are, these are deeply philosophical issues that need to be uh, discussed uh, in, in the public realm. In the public, we do need to respect the public, as Bill has said, uh, the, the, the variance of responses that uh, we'll get from people from different cultural backgrounds and socioeconomic status and, and so forth. And so by having uh, this discussion today, uh, I think that the American Heart Association is really uh, going to be a leading uh, entity in, in ensuring that um, the public is informed and that, they, that, their, uh, that their responses to this uh, potential therapy are, are uh, heard and respected. Yeah, so I want to I wanna follow up on that and say I think this is a very important discourse that we were able to at least start this morning by engaging so many people some of this thought process. And we actually had an audience of hundreds of people because it was an opening plenary session for the conference. And 
so two to three hundred responses for each of the questions that we asked of the audience and then a large number of questions that were asked of the audience in reverse of us. And so we're, I think we're all committed to finding some format in which we can make the results of our polling available to the AHA membership and really the public at large to really help to kickstart these discussions that need to happen. And so I would close by, by saying that this was a very instructive experience. The results were not necessarily what I expected, but that I think is why we do these sorts of things or why we should do these sorts of things. And I think conferences like ATVB, PVD are wonderful opportunities to have many people in the same room to be able to hash out some of these issues. This is not the sort of thing that would be so easy to do if you're trying to do this remotely, if you didn't have a big conference where people were getting together and mixing together and having these conversations. It'd be very hard to do if you sent a poll out to very many people, as you can appreciate uh, the response rates to those tend to be very low. And a person sitting at home watching a pre-camp lecture and then answering some of these questions is a very different experience, I think, than having everyone in the room uh, together really be able to feed off each other with respect to the questions that are being asked um, in both directions. And perhaps I'll close by just uh, addressing a very interesting question that came up. So we're all very excited about CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing because not only does it underlie a lot of what we do in our laboratories, but it really does potentially feed into the AHA mission, which is to reduce uh, the risk of cardiovascular diseases and stroke and keep people healthy of those, uh, healthy and free of those diseases in the long term. And I think both on the scientific side as well as potentially the therapeutic side, CRISPR-Cas9 is clearly going to have an important role to play. But one very interesting question that was asked of us by an audience member was, well, if you are able to eliminate cardiovascular disease, does that mean we're all going to die of cancer instead? And it's one of those fun things. I don't want to like trivialize it, but it's one of those fun, interesting theoretical exercises I think that if we truly are successful in our mission, the AHA mission, to which we're all firmly committed, uh, point of the matter is everyone's going to die of something. And you know, I close the session with uh, my observation that it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world to die of heart disease, but you want to do it when you're 100 years old. You want, don't want to do it when you're 50 or 60 years old. Mm. So the, the point is really not to necessarily entirely eliminate heart disease, but really to help people live free of heart disease and stroke for very long, fulfilling lives. And that's really uh, what I think CRISPR-Cas9 and other types of genome editing are going to allow us to do going forward. Thanks so much for listening.